Okay, so if I remember correctly, this is the the Worf is a bad father show. Yep, as many as many Worf and Alexander episodes are. Uh, I want to. Oh, we're we're already recording, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I almost wanted my nephew, who's eight, who would be just the right age for this, to watch this and give his thoughts or discuss it with us. But I quickly changed my mind about that, and I will tell you why as the episode goes along. That being said, uh, welcome to uh, Next Generation's First Generation, a Star Trek Next Generation Watch Along podcast, where on the 30th anniversary of the episode's airing, we get me, being me, Patrick Delmore, and he, Sasha Shouty, uh, get together and uh, do some commentary on Star Trek The Next Generation, one of our favorite shows growing up. This episode aired at some point in 1991. Yeah, I think it was December 30th, 1991. Oh my God. What a weird time to air an episode of a TV show right before the new year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Well, uh, now this is the time for you to sync up your viewing device. And we'll give you the countdown. We are watching on the Netflix version. That is and, true. Uh, we're going to give you the countdown of five, four, three, two, and play. Hey, and I can see it on my, uh, my tablet this time. So we actually Yay. are. We're approaching the planet Bellana I know we were having technical difficulties the last few episodes. I'm glad that you can see it. The Enterprise has been asked to participate in one of the first tests of this new technology. So we're going to test the technology that it's kind of funny because this foreshadows some stuff that Discovery is doing right now with uh, with warp capabilities. But this is the this is the genesis of using a wave to to warp around instead of using the warp drive. And Jordy mentions Chuck Yeager and also Zephram Cockrum. Well, he would meet in a couple of years. Yeah, it's it's kind of meta that he's talking about the event that he would later participate in. Yep. Very exciting. <laughs> Worf is so deadpan. Yeah, this is great. Donaldson, you're an engineer. Jordy's looking for fanboys oh. to geek out with. Nobody else really cares. Transfer the signal to and the Harlem Globetrotters theme begins to play because who's Collie Worf? Wyatt Sweet Georgia Brown. Mother. No. That's the name of the uh, actor. Yeah. Brown. <laughs> Unfortunately, she passed away uh, not too long after this episode, 1992. He used to play like real hotsy totsy for the 60s. Oh, I bet. Um, but I'm glad that they brought her character back. Now, this is a new actor playing Alexander. He's the one who will play Alexander for the rest of the series mm -hmm. and then we'll have a different actor play him on uh, deep space nine uh this character the this actor i think his name's uh brian bonsall if i remember correctly yes and he played the youngest keaton child on um family ties family. yeah well it's too bad we didn't get to see see daddy in this yeah, or have some kind of conversation about what Alexander's relationship with um, with his with his grandfather was, because we do talk a lot about his relationship with his birth mother, but virtually once um, once Georgia Brown leaves, they don't really talk about except that Alexander slept in his dad's old room, mm -hmm. and even what it was like for Alexander there and there really doesn't get to be I mean we'll get Michael Roshenko will get, be introduced eventually Warp's human brother but the stories about Warp growing up on Earth are kind of few and far between there's a real dumb one on Deep Space Nine about how he had butted a kid these are the mm -hmm. monsters of the Starship Enterprise it's continuing mission but now I mentioned that <laughs> I would have liked to have shown this to my nephew, who's eight, about Alexander's age. But he has never watched any Star Trek, and I was like, if I was eight, 
and an adult told me to watch a show about a kid being bad, I would be like, oh God, what did he find out that I did? <laughs> <laughs> like, did, did, did my mom tell him I, about something I got in trouble for and now he wants to talk to me about it? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I'm not sure every kid would read into it that way, but I could definitely see the direction where you take it. I was uh, a little surprised to learn that it wasn't the same actor playing Alexander in Next Generation between what we saw in the last uh, last time we saw him and now. Um, well, that because... the reason we know that is because of the first actor that played Alexander, unfortunately, uh, ended his own life a number of years ago. Yeah. And people were like, oh my god, Alexander killed himself. And it's like, oh, one episode Alexander, not the one we think of. Not that it makes it any less of a tragedy, but... Right. Yeah, it's never good when we see people prematurely leave this this existence. Though, I, I do have to say that, you know, when I'm looking at Alexander, the character... Um, He's very much living a shadow of Worf's life. Mm -hmm. So he, his mother was killed. Uh, so he got sent off to live with his parents. Um, but he just kind of gets passed around because he's not adjusting well to human uh, culture. And then eventually he joins the Klingon Defense Force because he wants to kill himself in the war. Um, <clears throat> then you look at Worf, who... Uh, was adopted by these parents and he had a hard time adjusting and it was never really easy but you know uh, the the mother was always the I, I always love my kid I, I don't care what's going on like she, she hits him with nothing but love um, yet Worf has always lamented how it's it's difficult that he is a Klingon raised by humans so I can definitely see like a third act where what if Alexander's kids, uh, what, how would they do or how well would they function? Just, right. Uh, if I remember, there was an episode in another season or two where Alexander comes back from the future to yes. kill his father because he resents not being introduced into Klingon culture earlier. I'd like to, and I'd like to see, uh, Future Alexander at some point uh, come back. I liked that character quite a bit. Oh yeah. In this scene, uh, Mom and Worf are having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation in the ten forward, and this is one of the few times where you really see Worf look lovingly at somebody. He has those really nice, honest family smiles that you don't really see. This is one of the rare times where we actually see Worf let his guard down and he's being yep. his true self. Yes, until uh, until Deep Space Nine, definitely. Oh, he's he regressed as such a character in Deep Space Nine. It's like he reminded me of someone who went through PTSD and just wants to hide in a hole and hmm. be on the defensive all the time. Well, his connection to I think, you know, his connection to his human parents is you know, it's a re it's a real connection. Um, his connection to Klingon culture is based on the concept of honor, which, if um, Alexander was a little bit older, he could have called him out on that in a more appropriate way than he does in this. He does this, you know, all you care about is honor thing, and he's kind of right, but he's also too little to understand what he's saying. Yeah. So, is it appropriate at any time to just drop off your child uh, to the to the parent without any notice and say, oh, he's living with you now. See you later. People do it all the time. Really? Yep. Can you imagine how unwanted you must feel if you were that child? Yeah. Um, people used to sell their kids. Look at those pockets on that jacket. Yeah. Holy cow. He could hide all sorts of stuff in there. Tricorders, phasers, tribbles. I understand you all that candy nobody gave him. Good. <laughs> Man, nice. that that kid looks so bored. Like, oh, okay, we're going here. Oh, there's the teacher. I think her name's Miss Kyle. He stinks. Very nice to see you again. And you must be Alexander. 
Um, but there's lots of different teachers on the Enterprise. We see all, all sorts of different ones. It would have been nice if they had given her a little bit more of a character. She's got kind of a, she has kind of a Betty Aberlin from Mr. Rogers thing going on. Mm-hmm. Where she, um, she's open, but she's guarded. Well, that's, I think, good teacher. Where she sees something a little upsetting and she doesn't want to rudely call somebody out on it. Yeah, none of the other bridge officers obviously have kids in the program. So that's that's tough. The um, I like that she doesn't really directly get into the... It, it's hard to have a Klingon at a school that's right now full of humans. Because it doesn't look like the kid, any of the kids are prejudiced toward him at all. No, not at all. And I know that's different in other instances where you introduce an oddball kid. By the way, uh, Miss Kyle here, uh, played by Jennifer McEdwards, is also known as Heidi in the uh-huh. in, uh, the made-for-television movie on NBC. So. The one that preempted the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Between the Oakland Raiders and the New York Jets. The best Heidi is the, uh, what's it, the Hayao Miyazaki made for TV Heidi. Mm, I don't think I've seen that one. Oh, it's neat. I mean, it's long. It's like they used to do, you know, classic books the, before they were, they did big movies. Oh. Yeah. And then Shirley Temple did a good Heidi also. Yes. So it's interesting that they don't have any kind of a schedule for him and they just page, they just page Worf about this all the time, which I guess with the parents that aren't officers, you can do this and they can just kind of go back and forth. It seems like they would have, they would treat Worf a little bit differently. Um, the school here is what what would amount to being like a school on a base, which I know your spouse attended school on a base. If I'm not oh mistaken. yeah. So, so she would have so she would have a better idea of what that's like. Always moving. I mean, the base schools weren't so bad. It's just the no. problem was you were always moving around, so you never really had time to make long term friends. Yeah, that's uh, what most. Of the- most of the kids on the Enterprise are, are, are like too, because they're not the they're not officers' kids. They're people whose families serve a small amount of time on the ship and then go somewhere else. All right, this scientist is also Pete in Voyager, huh. uh, the the guy who runs the um, the uh, the uh, Voyager project with Barkley. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And there's the explanation of a wave moving a ship into warp. Everybody's super jazzed about this, except for Mr. Worf. Oh, uh, one thing I did want to comment on. um, Worf kind of openly says in the future that he's never really has time to be a father, that he's too busy being a warrior, living a warrior's life. And that even here, you know, in the early episodes, you can see Worf is all about, uh, he's basically the helicopter parent that wants to mold the child in his image and it just horribly backfires. Mm-hmm. And uh, we can see when Worf is talking to Captain Picard about, oh, yes, I got this child who came on board, I have to do medical records, school records, and the doctor pages, or not the doctor, um, the teacher uh, pages. And Picard sees that Worf has his hands full, and what does he do? He dismisses Worf. Hey, you know, take it easy. You don't you don't need to work right now. Go take care of your kid. And that's the last thing that Worf wants to do because Worf is all business. He can never get enough work. Yeah. But this is uh, this is the now beginning to see the, the Troy Worf relationship that will eventually develop because she is thrilled in a non a totally unprofessional way that she wants to know 
what kind of a dad Worf is going to be. Mm-hmm. This is sort of the, hey, I, I just learned something unexpected about this person. And I want to see if I could cultivate that to be what I'm looking for in a partner. Oh, you think that uh, Troy is kind of shopping, trying him on? Yeah. I was never happy that Troy and Riker uh, finally ended up together. I would have liked to see the the Troy Wharf uh, thing kind of play out. They just did a big novel about it called Shadows of Offended. And then there's Mm. a Peter David novel that was done before that about how Troy and Warp broke up and she got back together with Riker. I don't mind the two of them together. Uh, This is a badly planned field trip that they're on. Because what happens is there's a bunch of models on a table and Alexander pockets one of them. Now, Mm -hmm. when you have a big group of kids and you have a matter replicator, uh, there would just be a tub of those models. (laughs) (laughs) Take one. Yeah, there'd be more than any kid could need. And it's funny that they, you know, just set it up with like, let's have like one of each thing. Because you think that like the kids would be fighting about them, about them otherwise. I love, uh, I love these puppets. Yeah, we've actually seen this creature come back in Deep Space Nine. I think oh, nice. they're called a, a Gilko, Grilko, something like huh. that. Um, but it's one of the few times we get to see puppeteering on this show. It's it's very rare. Yeah, we saw one of uh, the collector episode. Mm-hmm. That collected data. Oh, yeah, we did. That's right. How many times can we reuse this this prop? Well, it was a different animal in that one. But it, all of it makes me think of Flight of the Navigator and all of the menagerie that that, that ship has on it. I heard they're going to remake that. Uh, I could see that. Mm-hmm. So uh, to go to go back to your comment about um, if they have an abundance of things because of matter replication, they would have a tub of these toys. Um, but they need to set up a, a a source of conflict where where uh, Alexander broke the rules, and yeah. maybe this was a poor example. I don't know, a little kid just kind of picking up something neat. Oh, definitely. Uh, but um, so, emba- so embarrassing for him to have his dad, you know, defend him and then go in his pocket about it. They look more to the idea that Warp is embarrassed about it. But you know what? I think Alexander handled that in a very Klingon way. He maintained yep. unwavering eye control or uh, eye contact with his dad while his dad was searching his pockets. Like, he he did he wasn't sad he wasn't scared he wasn't angry he wasn't defending himself he he was just i think waiting for the next big thing to happen and compliment sandwich that's what Worf should have said to him he was like you know even though even though you lied you know you 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 respected me as your father in that moment and but he's he's not he doesn't understand he doesn't understand the compliment sandwich no, and that's partially because uh, Troy doesn't do that very often. <laughs> so here Worf is giving Alexander the third degree, and he says Alexander's answers to all his questions ring true to me. Um, so Alexander says, I don't know a couple times as to why he's doing all these things. You know, I was that ass of a kid that just did really bonkers strange things and you know i'd pick things up put it in my pocket or i'd be deliberately rude to people or like i was just i was not a nice child and when i would get the third degree like what alexander's getting now that would i honestly had no idea why i was doing what i was doing and it frustrated me that everyone was looking for intention because i'm like at the, I just I saw an opportunity and I took it. I don't know what else to say. Yep. And the thing is that sometimes sometimes you have to change the environment to suit the child, not change the child to suit the environment. Mm. Right now it's a situation where they should be changing the environment to suit the child. Because it's not an ideal situation for Alexander to be in right now. <laughs> and so what if what does Worf do? He he teaches uh 
he gives Alexander the equivalent of a Bible verse to fix this. Yeah. Talking about Kalos and lies uh, and dishonor and stealing. Something I forgot to point out is when uh, Alexander had to tell the teacher his birthday. Mm -hmm. You know, well, that's because Worf has no idea when his birth, when his son was born, right? Yeah, that's right. It was a big mystery. Yeah. He, did, he didn't know uh, Alexander existed until uh, What's-Her-Face just beamed on board. Yeah, so so Alexander, you know, is, kind of waits for his dad to give the, the birthday, and then he, he doesn't, he gives it himself, and, and Worf's like, yes. <laughs> so there are, I'm, I'm going through the, uncredited ghost stars and all the children are just listed as a boy yeah there was an incident no nope. there is now troy she really walks a strange line between an insufferable know-it-all who wants to get into everybody's business um and she either does this as the guise of i'm being your friend or I'm a professional and this is unhealthy and I'm, I'm going to impose myself on you, which is just really this is out of pocket. You would have more than one ship's counselor. Troy would not be the one that the people that serve on the bridge with her see as a counselor. Um, but she, because I mean, it's like she has she has that ulterior motive of she's she does she is interested in alexander's well-being but she's also interested in war mm -hmm. she wants to be part of his family and we're going to see this ensign i believe she was in the episode before this and she's definitely in the episode after this for some reason, I thought Luxana Troy was in this episode too. The the one where they go to the mud baths and learn. Yeah, that's to be that's happy. coming up this season. I was just peeking ahead. Mm -hmm. and that's uh, what it's what, easy to con it. It's easy to confuse the two. To tell you the truth, yeah. It's the test ship had successfully entered warp, sir. Some well, that uh, that ship that they're chasing after is a redressed Mars defense ship. In case you were wondering, from uh, when the Borg decided to come and visit. So, this is a really bad B plot. I mean, this the whole episode is two B plots, really. Um, usually, the the emotion, um, the character building plot is the the B plot, and the science fiction is the main plot. And whenever it seems like whenever we have a character building episode, it's a pretty lame sci-fi episode. If you've noticed, um, yeah, and it would have been. I'm trying to think if Jordy and Alexander ever have a scene together in like the whole history of the show. Like it would have been interesting for. For Alexander to like go around and see what everybody on the ship does, what all Worf's work buddies get into. Yes, and we would be able to see so much more of the ship. Yeah. I mean, it's really cool that we get to see this cargo bay museum ish place and we get to see the school, which is also really cool. But, uh, you know, Alexander could be the viewer's eyes and ears to just explore this beautiful ship. Yep. Oh man, everybody's falling over. Look at, oh man, did you just see uh, Riker just rolled on his back? Yep. That's, he says, okay guys, I'm only going to give you one take because that's all I got. <laughs> oh, I always forget that the, the cast knows how to duck and roll in unison when the camera yep. shoots. They learned it from Dr. McCoy. Oh, yeah. What'd you think of my fall there? <laughs> so this doctor here just looks like he's a burn victim from some really bad uh, hot food. Like yeah. the, too much ghost pepper on that burger there. Roadside skippers. <laughs> Are you still tracking the wave? 
Yeah, so anyway, the test ship exploded. The Enterprise got knocked out of warp, and they're just trying to figure out what's going on. And they're coming up. They're just realizing they're going to have to... They're going to have to catch this wave and cancel it out. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it will wipe out a planet. Which reminds me of a similar problem where you remember probably, I think... Oh, it was about maybe five or six episodes ago where a governor of a Klingon world was providing weapons uh, to rebels. Um, they were uh, Romulan weapons disguised as Federation weapons or something. Uh-huh. Bogus thing like that. And you had Jordy and Worf in the, in the uh, engine room just doing a phaser fire test right in front of the warp core. And, and Data was sitting down or you know standing down range where he could have easily gotten shot had the rifle just been bumped or something like that and now they're repeating the same setup where you have this massive wave generator firing uh at a ship and a planet is down range and of course what happens is that they can't stop the wave and now they're gonna have down range uh it's just, shall we say, um, casualties, uh, secondary casualties, I could say. Uh, that's not really well thought out. No. Oh, here we go. She's calling him a bully. He starts the fight and then says someone else uh, started the fight. And that's what kids, that's funny because like that's what kids do. It's like she's, a, she's like the worst kind of substitute teacher. Klingons do not listen to teachers. That, you know, actually, the things that she's complaining about are legitimate kid things. But yeah. you think that as a teacher, she'd be able to handle these a little bit better. Yeah, without bringing the dad, without bringing the dad in. Oh, and the dad has the dad. now been told to go talk to to uh, Counselor Troy. I think we should. I will handle this. Yeah. Uh, you didn't. You didn't want to. Co- you didn't want to collaborate with me. You just told me a bunch of stuff about not liking my kid. It's like, sorry, taking it out of your hands now. All right, right here is the biggest difference between boomers and Gen X. Is that boomers? The teacher yells at the parent because their kid is doing bad, and Gen X, they yell at the teacher because the kid is doing bad. So this is very much a, a boomer response that work has. Look at this kid hacking and slashing with uh, the Skeletor of Star Trek. Yeah. And you know that's not bad fighting right there. Oh. And Worf is actually kind of happy. Here was the perfect teaching moment. Worf could have said, those were some amazing moves. You, did you learn this on your own on Earth? There we go. But no, he had an opportunity, just like you said, the, the compliment sandwich. It's not present. I mean, unfortunately, where Warp is at is like, ideally, Alexander not on the ship at all. Uh, however, if that can't be the case, Alexander needs to do something that he doesn't worry about. So he, he's now come up with the idea that he's going to send Alexander to a Klingon school. It's just like, how does that work? You were Return discommodated. He's still this good, discommodated, right? Not now. Uh, get- no, he helped with the Civil War. So, like, he's back to neutral. Okay, but still, he's, he's the son of somebody that, you know, is sort of without honor. I mean, the guy, the guy to talk to about this is that, unfortunately, he's not available. He's hiding out on Romulus is Spock. Yes, because Worf and Spock had very similar childhoods. You will learn the lessons I have failed to teach you. No, I um, go. Spock did the whole, um, you, you know, go to Starfleet instead of being part of his culture thing. And although I don't, I, I'm trying to think did that might not have come up until Discovery about the specifics of that. Yeah, no, we we didn't know too much about young Spock until the movie started kicking it. 
Yeah, just like we didn't with know Ward. that he was raised by a human mother, just like Worf had that mm. pull to be with his own culture, but it ultimately ultimately did not made the decision to be in Starfleet. Where yes, they're unlike with Worf, there were no other thing on Starfleet. There were other Vulcans in Starfleet, but Spock still was with humans most of the time. Mm-hmm. We're probably going to hear it from some of the TOS fans who listen in on the show, but I would lo- I would almost beg to argue that the character development, like the backstory of both Worf and Spock are quite similar, where we only kind of piece it all together a little bit at, the t- at a time. And it's not until we get to the conclusion of the show that we kind of put it all together in our minds as to where we rewatch. So when... It's kind of it's kind of like listening to watching a, a whodunit show for the very first time. You don't know the circumstances, you don't know the details, and so you're only getting little bits and pieces. But if you rewatch the series over and over and over again, you know this character by the time they walk in season one, episode one, and exactly what they're going to do and how they're going to respond. But that's not the case the first time going through. And I think that sometimes we forget that we have the complete picture uh, just coming from that bias. I'm not here to approve or disapprove of the way you raise your son. Oh, there they are in the counselor's office. This is probably the sixth or seventh time we've seen her office now. Counsel me, counselor. This is a big office. I was quite surprised. I will be pleased that he's receiving It's a lathe mushroom. Look at that. And another one. Or are those lights? No. Some shitty art some family member gave her to her that she can't throw away. A family. Things I could not provide for. She should she be more like you know, I can't she's like, I can't tell you how to be a parent because I'm not one, but I think that I could help Alexander quite a bit by talking to him about how he feels about his environment and helping him adjust. Because he's like, Worf at this point is not really willing to hear Alexander out on anything. No, Worf just wants Alexander to obey. Yeah. And Worf never comes down to Alexander's level. Like I said, I mean, at the holodeck, if Worf just jumped in there and said, you did a really good job. Do you want to try level two? I'll join yep. you. And then they could just go running and screaming and tearing through the holodeck together like yep. Klingons. And yeah, then after be- after they've worn themselves out, they're, they're kind of just sitting there over all the dead bodies, having a good one-to-one chat of how good the fight was. That's when he could have brought up, so I heard you're having problems at school. Yep. Or even like, you know, if you want to do this next week, let's get a good report from your teacher. It's possible. Mm-hmm. You know, work on that. You can have the, you know, you can have this as a reward. But Worf doesn't want to bond with Alexander. Not at all. No. And I get this. I always thought that I'd be a really good parent, and then I hang around uh, some of the younger children in my family, and I kind of wonder, is this really what I want? I can't tell. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Now now we're talking about the the death of the mother. But how she did not tell me about him when he was born. So you were angry. I like that she's like the night that Kalar died, and it's like not the night that Kalar was murdered. Of course not. Because Kalar was murdered. Oh yes. That was a weird that was a weird thing where you know she gets killed and Worf goes and kills the guy that kills her. And even that, like, that'd be a story for Worf to tell Alexander, you know, because, again, if you really want to cement the idea that Klingons and the humans are a different culture, to tell his son that, you know, their, their, their bond is extremely strong. And that it's like, despite the fact that I want you to be respectful at school, if somebody really hurt you, I'd kill them. Whoa. Yeah. I did it for your mom. And it's not beyond worth to do that. 
He's it's very in character. Yeah. <laughs> that god awful chair. I hate that oh, chair so much. I think everybody <laughs> else on the show hated the chair. Oh, I remember watching uh, Michael Doran sitting in that chair uh, during the the not the unification. Uh, it was when right after the Borg episode with family, I think it was called or something like that. He's entertaining mom and dad in the den. That is not true. Oh, you care about it. Honor. Uh, honor is not a joke. If your mother were here. Oh, if your mother was here. Oh. My mother wouldn't send me away. Wouldn't have sent him away. Yeah, she would have loved him and pulled him in. Like He's like, Grandma sent me away. You're going to send me away. Just send me away. Just send me away. Yeah. I would have liked it if you'd just taken the... I mean, they couldn't, obviously, because they need the set, but if you'd just taken that bath and started carving up the walls of Warp's room. Or running down the hallway, scratching the... the yeah. It's the, like, this, is, <laughs> yeah, this is what you get if you tell me you're sending me to a, to a school somewhere else and just, um, you know, carve everything up. And Worf has no idea what a Klingon school would actually be like. I don't wonder that his human father didn't sometimes get mad and threaten him. Like, you know, we could send you right back to Klingon or to Kronos. It's, it's, it's the military school. school. It's the military school threat. Yeah. Already sitting on Data's lap. Wait, what? No. Whoa, geez, they are really close together. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Data is, uh, he's the ventriloquist in Jordy. I know. I wonder if Brent Spiner was playing with LeVar Burton, just like got right up on him. <laughs> like, don't, like, I'm just going to sit here. Don't react. Like, the second the camera cuts, Brent, what the hell? What? <laughs> so close. Data always sits to Jordy. Why are the Enterprise to go through the wave? Why can't we go around? Well, the wave keeps on growing. We're going back to the original story here. It's like at warp, just about warp seven. And they got to go through the wave in order to stop it or some nonsense thing. The shields are down to 33%. It's going to be quite a ride, Riker says. Yeah, so there's so really what they're saying is there's no earthly way of knowing just how fast the wave is going. So why couldn't they do a saucer separation and and you know keep all the the zoo animals from dying? Budget. Oh yeah. I wonder if they costed that out, like how much it would cost to do a saucer separation. It was probably similar to the transporter effect on the original series, where it was a bit of money. Uh, we see that ensign a few times. Yeah, she's back in the next episode, and I think she was in the episode before. I don't think she has a name, though. Uh, Felton, I think. Huh. wonder if she shows up again in any of the extended universe stuff. Well, in the, uh, in the canon, she was in Matter of Time with uh, the one we just did, Newground, yep. this one, and in hero worship which is the next one yeah it was probably hey we need an ensign to for the next two weeks and you might be in a couple of episodes because they you know kind of film these kind of mis mismatched yeah we're about to head into the thank goodness science on the enterprise is completely made up because alexander would be dead here in a Mm -hmm. Oh, she was uh, the in the Masterpiece Society, too. Okay, that's coming Moab up. Oh, Four. Man, I tell you, I love the internet. You can just go down on these really strange tangents. Oh, and she was an imaginary friend. Holy cow. So that's also, five of them. With we Kirsten Dunst. Yeah, that's right. All right, now her name is Sheila Franklin. What has she done? 
All these young looking ki- actors are all so old nowadays. Yeah, it was 30 years ago. So crazy. Mm-hmm. Oh, she was Barbara in Home Improvement. I did not know that. Oh, is that Jill's good friend? I believe so. Yeah. With Cavi Raz and Kevin Brief. And she was in the film Centurion Force, too. I have no idea what that is. I wonder what the difference between feature and guest actor are. So I'm noticing that a lot. It's a very specific uh, distinction. Uh, it's where your name is in the credits and what the pay you get for the episode is. Well, here we go. This is the high stakes, low stakes B plot. Oh, the deck's flooded with radiation. There are people down there. You need to get the animals. Yeah, everywhere, everywhere is radioactive. There's every, but so they can't get in the normal way. So he just rips Orf, the panel off the wall. Look at this. Or rips the door open, and now. If you did what he did and a big fire explosion came out of the door, that means that basically he let oxygen into an area that should not have let oxygen let into it. And Alexander and the aliens would just be a couple of crispy critters. Get the crispy critters. I love you so much. I saved you from barbecue. They have a rule about what happens with any kind of flame on the ship that makes sense. Where, it's, where it has like a thing comes down, it's immediately extinguished. But now like a whole space could be on fire. And what and what are they breathing on this ship? Because if it's pure oxygen, they're you can't have open flame. Yeah, well, they probably have an oxygen nitrogen yeah. mix. It's luxury in space, so they probably have a little bit of argon in there too, and nice earthly mix of carbon dioxide and ozone. Well, he looks like he's got his poopy face going on there. Look at that. Hell, it was too heavy to lift. If only Data had come down. Yeah, no kidding. Well, don't worry. Data's going to move something heavy in the next episode. Alexander, don't die here. You'll die without honor. I'm a scared mister. Kamehameha! My mom could have lifted it faster. Look at that grant. <laughs> the grandpa a like, oh. couple of locks. <laughs> oh, brother. I love you, Daddy, but I've got to poop a There's little. No time. Please, don't die. That kid must have had so much fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got to come out of Riker. And some of these sets were in different buildings, too, so it's not like you could just run around the entire Enterprise. It was... No, I wouldn't think so. Different buildings, different sets, different days, and they'd take this up. Mm -hmm. There they are. Someone did a matte painting for this episode. It was called 101. And I missed it. I wanted to look out for it. Painting 101 by Dave Archer. It was for the scene in the teacher's office and classroom. This is the only episode featuring this painting, but I, I missed what the painting was. So. I have to go back. Yeah, I didn't cotton to that either. Yeah. It's um, all right. Well, we're just about coming to the end. We are scanning we are making sure he's okay we're filling his belly really with they a... had, this is a technology you really wish they had nowadays because man smoke inhalation is no joke oh no yeah you don't want that copd for the rest of your life apology lollipops yes father <laughs> i bet she has some pretty cool lollipops goth flavored lollipop 
for a lollipop that has a gawk and like live gawk inside of it. The it's like the Charlie gummy worms, but they wiggle down in real life. I'm sorry. I promise I'll be good. I promise I'll be good at the Klingon school. I'll make you proud of me and I'll come back in time and try to kill you. Klingon schools are designed to be difficult. The physical and mental hardships. First, is first of all, if you go in there with a grudge against me, they will forge that grudge into a revenge fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet you that not not honoring your father, like having a grudge against your dad, is probably very anti Klingon. Oh, not at all. If, no? if if he was able to make the case for it. They would be, you know, every all the training would be like, we would imagine that that, you know, whatever it is, is your father. Especially because of who his father is. A lot of guys don't like war. True, true. Are you, are you, actually, father. that would be a really brilliant way for for Alexander to reclaim his honor as a Klingon. So say like war sent him to the Klingon school. And Alexander does his adolescence and young adulthood at this this Klingon military academy. His whole thing would be to just whine and bitch and moan to just about everybody. Oh, look at that. Episodes then. Um, whine and bitch and moan to everybody that the um, that his father dishonored him. He, he robbed him of his Klingon heritage and cultural ways by deliberately raising me by humans. Now I have to be twice as badass as any other Klingon here just to offend my father and regain my honor. That would have been an epic story arc, and I think it would totally. have played it would have played really well for Deep Space Nine. It wouldn't have gone over at all for Netflix. But had they brought Alexander back in Deep Space Nine as like the baddest of the bad mofos, it totally kicks worse ass and say, "This is for your dishonor," and spits on him and walks out would be a yeah, great they, opener. Could have had a better t- story with Tony Todd than they did. Or mm. have Tony Todd be being hunted by Alexander? Uh, who? Wait, who's Tony Todd? Uh, Worf's brother. Uh, we're, oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh. Uh, he, by him. Gets to Deep Space Nine and gets killed. And Worf's like, you know, you've led this assassin here. And then it turns out it's Alexander. Yeah. I've come for you, Dad. <laughs> All right. Well, we, got, we had plenty to talk about on that one. I give that one a four out of five. Just because, like you said, that... Warp Wave story is a big yawn. Yeah. Even though it shouldn't be. I think they were proud of the special effects that they built, but uh, yeah. them look great uh, 30 years later. Well, they, they subcontracted those special effects. So the same company who did the graphics in The Child made this wave. So, ah. uh, but, you know, this is, this is kind of what I said um, earlier in the episode and how I've been kind of always been saying uh, since we were recording is that any character developing episode is usually pretty boring and so i give it high ranks for being this is an important thing that you should watch but is a total snooze fest for kids um it's not exciting oh there are some flames but uh the only the only thing though is i remember you saying um pat that you loved episodes with kids in them while you yep. were a kid watching this. Yep. Um, so I bet you this one felt pretty good for you when you were a kid. Uh, to, to a degree, I don't, this one does not stick out in my mind very much. I'm sure that I remember it, it happening, but yeah. Um, I think the most memorable part of it was, you know, again, I would worry that my nephew, if I had introduced him to this show and showed it about a kid being bad and the parent, you know, wanting to send them away, he would have thought that I had heard about him being bad. But me watching it, it was that whole thing with the grandmother leaving him. Saying like, yeah, I'm going to take you back to be with your dad. And I almost wonder, like, there had to have been a straw that broke the camel's back with her that she didn't uh, she didn't tell Warp about. Mm. Something had to, something had to happen where it was like because initially they agreed that they were going to keep Warp's kid, but there is obviously like a line that was crossed where they said no, this isn't something we're capable of doing. I just wonder what that thing was. Mm. Well, boy, 
And they only go back and redo it. All right. Well, that just about wraps it up. Uh, I had a lot of fun on this one. Um, yeah. Our next episode coming up, I believe, is Hero Worship. So it's, uh, oh, it's in the new year, January 30, uh, 6, January 6th. This is great. Okay, folks. Well, with that being said, uh, thanks so much for listening and have a wonderful day. Music provided by lofigirl.com. Artists include Tenno, Daydreaming, BVG, in Mondberg, Insomnia, WYS, Snowman, Be Common Banks, Because. Episode cover art created by Matthew Kirshner. Podcast logo and main cover art provided by David Clawwitter. Audio engineering done by Sasha Shoudies.